escape. Drilling augers. Conflict. Imagination. Sex. Mangoes. Surrealism. Surrealism is an avant-garde movement intended to free the unconscious mind by illogical imagery and thought. Think Salvador Dali paintings. This movement rose out of the rubble of World War I, as many people felt that the war was a result of excessive rationality. If surrealism is too weird for you, don't even bother looking into Dadaism. If surrealism were the weird neighborhood kid, Dadaism is their village idiot parent. Surrealism influenced visual art, novels, plays, and, of course, films. If you're wondering, Eraserhead totally counts. One playwright and novelist from the movement is a man by the name of Jean Genet. Some of his plays were adapted to films, which leads us to today's dumpster find, the 1963 film adaptation of The Balcony. The Balcony is directed by Joseph Strick, before and after directing several things that most people have never heard of, and stars... Oh, jeez. Shelley Winters, Peter Falk, Lee Grant, Peter Broco, Jeff Corey, Kent Smith, and Leonard Nimoy, just to name a few. I'm gonna warn you right now, in case you haven't figured it out yet, things are probably gonna get a little bit weird. We start off with a bang. Literally and stock footage of violence and explosions and riots in the streets and geez, is that blood pouring out of that guy's head or did he spill his coffee? One thing we hear is a very obvious exact same shooting sound effect over and over again every time the guns go off. Either that or the guy is just amazing at shooting the exact same pattern over and over again. Despite the revolution raging outside, Irma, played by Shelley Winters, waits inside the balcony for visitors with her girls, including the stripper from the brain that wouldn't die. The balcony is not your average brothel. Oh, uh, did I mention it's a brothel? I feel like I said that rather suddenly. But it's more than that. It's a place where you can, you know, dress up and play drawn-out fantasies. Okay, I lied earlier. It's more than possibly going to get weird. It is definitely going to get weird. Jeff Corey plays the local gas man who enjoys pretending to be a bishop with Joyce Jameson as his confessee. Is that a word? It is now. The bishop seems to waver back and forth between reality and the illusion of being a bishop. He also seems to waver between being thrilled yet repulsed at the idea of the sins she confessed being real. Joyce Jameson tries telling him his time is up, but seems to enjoy the lingering as much as he does, so Irma has to come in and bring them both back to reality and let him know his time is up. Irma seems more like a den mother than anything else, but I guess if you think about it, that's kind of what madams are? I don't know, it's been a while since my madaming days. Think of them as patients if you want to, but visitors. I don't allow anyone, even myself, to refer to them in any other way. Lee Grant, ladies and gentlemen, playing Carmen, the former performer turn administrative assistant. Kent Smith plays a milk wagon driver who clearly wants to be an army general. This guy is obviously a regular as the girl playing his horse seems to know exactly what to say to him and those things are strangely specific. The nation weeps for that splendid hero who died in a battle. I understand the need to monitor what's going on in such a place, but there's still something really creepy about cameras in the room. The last cubicle we see is Peter Broco playing a public accountant, playing a judge, to a thief who really wants him to lick her shoe. Wait, whose fantasy is this? By the way, you may recognize Ruby Dee here only a couple of years after her breakout role as Ruth Younger in Raisin in the Sun. And I, I put on a, a dark brown suit, and I had a... Um, a black straw hat with cherries on it. That sounds incredibly tacky. And somebody said, you know, you know, she looks like a model. A model of tackiness? Bread. Money? No, 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 real bread. Oh, wonderful. Oh, sublime. I got nothing. 
Yes, it's true, Your Honor. I, I'm a, a bloodsucker. Oh, no. No, no. Well, she tried. No, that's for later. The judge really wants to beat a confession out of the thief. She agrees to let him on the condition that he crawls over and licks the toe of her shoe, which he does. And she seems to enjoy this a little too much. Maybe it's a power play kind of a thing. You know, I'll humiliate you and then you can humiliate me and now we're even. And in that case, you go, girl. It turns out Cartman hates her job and wants to go back to being a performer. I'm calling them performers because the entire time they're showing it, they're emphasizing more the fantasy role-playing rather than the actual act of, you know, I, I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Carmen says a messenger boy told her the city's full of corpses because of the revolution. She steals one of Irma's earrings and puts it on as she begs Irma to be allowed to perform once in a while. Irma says no, tells Carmen she loves George the police chief as much as she loves Carmen, kisses Carmen, then gives Carmen the other earring. Someone at the door tells Irma that George, played by Peter Falk, is wounded. Wasn't a bullet, it was gasoline. Turns out you're not supposed to drink it. George says Roger, the leader of the revolution, is winning. The general of the paratroopers is dead, the chief justice of the Supreme Court is dead, the archbishop is dead, and the queen cannot return to the country because the airport is on fire. George is now in charge. Irma breaks the news to him that the public may not recognize the chief of police as a leadership position. I run the biggest house of illusion in this part of the world. I sell people back their most hidden secret imaginations. People always want to play the important parts. Uh, animals, astronauts. Apparently animals were the most important things Irma could come up with. George wants Irma to play the queen for an hour or two. He's hoping that seeing the queen will give morale to the people. Or he's hoping the revolutionists will get mad that they didn't kill the queen. Or he thinks a queen will kill Roger. He's not all that specific on this plan. Because she's real and with her uh, embroidery and her exercises and mental telepathy, she pretends that she's false. Interesting point. Irma doesn't want to do it because she's scared of getting killed by a revolutionist. Meanwhile, she takes the bandage off of George's hand and leaves it, even though his hand was supposedly just burned by gasoline, and George is remarkably unfazed by this. She comes up with the idea that her visitors will be the replacement judge, general, and archbishop. Carmen goes to work talking them into it. But, uh, I, I have hemophilia. Oh, you mean like this guy from the beginning? Uh, but uh, it, it won't be possible. I'll, I'll be recognized. M my voice. M my mannerisms. That's right, because everybody knows the local gas man. George starts making a lovely, motivating speech to the nation from the brothel. Wait, maybe the women are the nation? Nope, nope, there's the nation. Well, I guess you never know when it's convenient to wire the local brothel for public announcements. People of the left, people of the right, people of the center. People of the up, people of the down, people of the over and under and through. Shut up, Grover. Jaywalking must be crushed. Really? Oh, shit. I mean, I mean, good, good. I would never dream of jaywalking. Who dares? Spit at it. Ooh, ooh, pick me! I will! Only a dwarf named Roger! Oh. Basically, George is telling everyone that Roger is a liar and terrible at his job as a revolutionary. Because the bishop and the general and chief justice will be going through town in a minute. We'll ride with the general. The bishop? Who many people have accused me of shooting for treason. Or for jaywalking. George announces that in three minutes he's going to blow up the bombs they set up in sewers all over the city so he can blow up Roger. Wait, but the city will be gone. We didn't really like this place much, did we? Irma reveals that she has a gun for protection and lets George take it from her. Well, 
Well, I guess that's one way to get rid of a rat problem. I wonder if these guys have ever met before, because otherwise that would make for a really awkward car ride. So you like to do it as a bishop? So you like to pretend to fuck your horse? Hooray, Roger! Roger is dead. Hooray for the queen. Well, that was easy. Oh my god. I just saw my wife in the crowd. And my dear Chief Justice, she was cheering at the top of her voice. My wife approves of my promotion from milkman to general! George watches the processional from... Where are these cameras exactly? Some areas are obviously devastated, as will happen when you blow the town up. And some are full of adoring fans. Who doesn't love a random general, judge, and bishop? All your collective crimes Burp. against the church and the state and our beloved queen. Yay! Is that her next to you and the general? So the bishop blesses the people, the general punishes the army or suspended their punishment because they put on a parade. Well, maybe that's how you get out of legal trouble. Just put on a parade. Hmm. And the Chief Justice goes to a morgue. I hereby declare a universal amnesty. You know we're all dead, right? And dissent no more. So does that mean they're all going to heaven now? The men return to the balcony and they decide that they're going to try to maintain this power they now have. George is clearly amused for a moment. He comes down and asks the men what they want in return for their put-up jobs. They're all fakes. And not even real fakes. Second-hand. Imitation fakes. Double negative means they're real. The general challenges George to shoot him. So George shoots him. But the gun isn't real. Now pissed, George runs upstairs and Carmen tells him to break down the door. Which is also not real. Carmen tells him to see the file they have on him, which I'm gathering is also not real. Oh, now she'll play the queen. George is upset that everything is fake except for himself because he's real because they need him. He keeps shouting that. Just when he and Irma are about to get down to business, Carmen bursts in and tells them Roger apparently did not die when the town blew up. And not only that, he is now downstairs waiting to play, of all things, the police chief. Yes, finally, Spock shows up in this fantasy. Carmen begs Irma to let her do this one, so she comes in as... Glory? Sure, I mean, he's the police chief in the middle of a bunch of rocks. It was either be Glory or a jaywalking pebble. As Glory and the fake police chief begin making out, George bursts in and basically offers Roger to kill or be killed. Then they try strangling each other, and the set falls down, and Irma sets off an alarm. An alarm that apparently brings out the girls to strip the men. Uh, apparently that did come in handy at one point. Now George and Roger are naked. They are thrown a couple of towels so they can sneak back out onto the streets. Do I look decent? I don't know. Where are you headed? Secret headquarters, I suppose. For that, you're fine. Thank you very much. Fair. That, that's fair. This leads George and Roger to part on amicable terms. Possibly because they're both naked and afraid of their towels falling off in a fight. Irma closes up the brothel for the night and tells the audience to go home where things are falser than they are in the movie. Alright, well now that she said that, I guess I don't need to go on. This review's obviously fake. The film opens to mixed reviews. The New York Times called it labored mockery, while Variety said it was a tough, vivid, and dispassionate fantasy that was at times acidly funny with excellent performances. I do have to agree with that one. The performances by the main cast are extremely well done. Some say Peter Falk was miscast in this piece, but I have to disagree. Then again, I love Peter Falk, and he can practically do no wrong in my eyes, so I might be the wrong person to ask. Despite being an Academy Award nominee for cinematography and preserved by the Academy Film Archive in 2010, this film appears to be out of print today, making it a bit of a mission to track down. So why is this film in the dumpster? Well, there's probably a few reasons. First of all, it is definitely dated. The height of surrealism was the 1920s and 30s, 
So although people were and still are interested in the genre, it wasn't the craze it was previously. Another big problem is the fact that it was advertised entirely wrong. If you see this poster with the quote, a shocking film worth being shocked by, or this advertisement with the quote, a bold, sexy, disquieting film strictly for adults, it sounds like a skin flick. And the person going to see a skin flick is probably not in the mood to analyze themes and motifs with no actual nudity. Unless that person is into Peter Falk's upper thigh. Every ad for this film shoves sex into the viewer's face, and though there is, I guess, some sex, if you count whatever the hell Lee Grant is doing right here as sex, that is clearly not the main takeaway for this film. This is surrealism, remember, and though surrealism likes to use shocking images and ideas, it's usually about something beyond that. Surrealism is meant to be analyzed to death, so I'll give it a go. Clearly, the main theme of The Balcony is reality versus fantasy in all aspects of our lives. When we look in the mirror, are we reminded of our reality or are we using that reflection as a front for the fantasy? That's not bad for right out the gate. Yeah, go me. Everything makes you question what's real and what isn't, and this film conveys this through surrealistic incompatibility. Sure, that's right. How you grammar. For example, the obviously stock footage of the outside revolution. Is it obviously fake because it's a low budget film? Or was it meant to feel fake? Or was it just convenient for both? Either he just ran over a cat or it was never intended for us to ever actually think there was a cat there. It was just another unsettling moment of, wait, was that real? The girl playing the horse is obviously not making these noises. <laughs> Birds randomly tweet as she walks past this set piece. The random goats bleating, making you wonder, do they really have goats? If they do, I don't want to know why. The graffiti above the car outside of the brothel reads liberty and chastity, two things that are not present inside or outside of the balcony. There is even that sense of where the hell is that camera when they're viewing the footage of the processional and the different cubicles. Only one character sees the world for what it really is in this film, and that is Irma. Her performers seem to enjoy the fantasies as much as the visitors, even down to Carmen not enjoying a real job and the real aspect of the business and wanting to go back into the fantasy playing. The country is under the illusion that everything is alright because they see people like the Archbishop and the General and the Chief Justice doing things that ultimately mean nothing, even if they had been performed by the real people. George is deeply disturbed when Irma tells him that nobody sees the chief of police as a position of power because nobody wants to play him in any fantasies. That is, until Roger comes along, and despite clearly having other problems that should take priority, such as, oh, I don't know, avoiding the people trying to kill him or finishing out the revolution he started, he instead chooses to risk all that to come into the balcony and portray, of all people, the chief of police. Is that what the revolution was all about in the first place? A sense of power and a sense of leadership? Is that part of the reason why they parted ways peacefully in the end? Because Roger coming in and choosing to wear his uniform gave George that illusion of power, then lowered both of them back down when they were both stripped of it? While Roger felt the illusion of power as police chief, then seeing George stripped of his uniform just like himself disillusioned him about that power? They are even dressed alike at the end when they leave, even down to the same hat, socks, and shoes. On the other hand, why is Irma so against playing the queen when George tells her it's for the good of the people? Is she really afraid of being killed, which would be a valid enough reason? Or is she afraid of delving into a fantasy? In which case, what is it about seeing George bully the imposters that brings her to give in and play the queen? The one part that still bugs me, as stupid as it sounds, the earrings. Is this supposed to be some sort of foreshadowing of passing the proverbial torch of the reality on to Carmen? Or is it because she loves Carmen, she doesn't want to lose her to the fantasy? If so, why does she let Carmen go back in the end and play glory for Leonard Nimoy's police chief? Is it because finally Irma gave in and was playing the queen for George? Surrealism is not necessarily supposed to answer all of your questions, nor is it necessarily supposed to show you all of the questions. And I've barely begun with the analysis of this film. If I were to try to find everything and do an in-depth analysis, we'd be here for days. And even afterwards, I'd still get people telling me, you didn't go far enough, or you barely scratched the surface, or you didn't find this and this and this and this and that. And some things I'd get right, some things I'd get completely wrong, 
some things I would find that never even occurred to the writers and directors. That's what surrealism is, basically. People accuse it of being pretentious and artsy, but this film, and any surrealist film, and really any film, is what you, the viewer, make of it. So check out this film, but be prepared to think because there are no boobs. Sorry. Coffee beans. <laughs>